Well, good day, folks. My name is Holger Neubauer. I'm the preacher of the Church of Christ at Lakeshore in South Haven, Michigan. Today, I want to do a review with you, a review of Brother Kyle Butt, who is a member of the Churches of Christ and who also works for Apologetics Press a parachurch organization that is devoted to the defense of Christian doctrine, disseminating their materials to defend the inspiration of Scripture, to debate the cause for God. Much of their work is after the line of Thomas B. Warren, whom I also appreciate. And yet Kyle has done a recent video on the second coming of Christ five-minute video in which he explains what he thinks will happen when a future second coming of Christ actually occurs. So I wrote to him and informed him that he had taken Matthew 24, 36 out of its proper context and asked him if he would debate, either a two-night or a four-night oral debate. His response was, there is plenty of material already written about in Apologetics Press. Well, there's plenty of material written about against atheism, and yet he debates atheists. Plenty of information for an agnostic to change his mind, and yet he debated Bart Ehrman, agnostic. So it seems that that particular answer that he gave me was not quite genuine. I don't want to look into his heart. We're not supposed to do that. By their fruits you shall know them. But it seems that that's not a good answer. Nevertheless, I want to review Kyle's lesson in which he affirms the second coming of Christ is still in our future, in which the universe will come to an end. We're rocketed up into the atmosphere to get stuck in the air. That Every eye is going to see him all over the earth, and then, you know, heaven can, can finally embark and hell can finally be completed. That's his doctrine. Well, Matthew 24 and verse 36, of course, has its own context. And I affirm that Jesus was not dividing the Olivet Discourse. It cannot be divided. I've actually written in a book, written a book, but of that day and that hour in which I demonstrate the Olivet Discourse is not divided. You can get that on Amazon. Matthew 24 and verse 36 is a direct citation from Zechariah 14 and verse 7, the day known to the Lord. Now Kyle agrees that the first part of the Olivet Discourse is dealing with the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. But we can demonstrate that Matthew 24 verse 36 is in the context of the destruction of Jerusalem, then Jesus did not change topics. Now, I affirm that Jesus always quotes in context. Kyle would say that as well. When a New Testament author quotes from an Old Testament text, they always quote in context. Now, as we consider the Olivet Discourse, we want to consider some other passages dealing with the same subject to get the full picture like the rich young ruler, right? So Mark calls him rich, Matthew calls him young, and Luke calls him a ruler. So we need to consider all of the texts about a subject to see the full picture. Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know its desolation is near. Then let those in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in her midst depart, let not those in the country enter her, for these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And vengeance means judgment. So all judgment comes then. In Luke 18, 31, where Jesus spoke, spoke about all things concerning the Son of God, he particularly was talking about his suffering and his resurrection. Now, however, he talks about judgment. No other qualifier. Judgment of the righteous blood shed from the foundation of the world. 
from righteous Abel to Zechariah, son of Barakias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar, will come upon this generation. All right? Same motif, same theme, same subject. All right. Now, Zechariah 12.1. We find that there is a burden that Zechariah had against Israel. A burden against Israel. When a prophet has a burden, he has a judgment message which he must tell. So he's burdened until he speaks the message. And this burden is against Israel. It's national judgment language. The burden against Babylon in Isaiah 13, 1 meant a nation like Babylon. Babylon is going to be judged by the Medes. Isaiah 19, um, 1, the burden against Egypt. Egypt is going to be judged. And there the Bible says the Lord would ride on a swift cloud. In Babylon falling, the heavens would be shaken, the earth would move out of her place. The whole world would be judged for its iniquity. That's the language of the prophets. Well, the burden against Israel, Zechariah 12, 1. And in Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 2, when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem, unmistakable language that ties this event to what Jesus said in Luke 21, 20 through 22. Unmistakable. You need help not to see it. And in this particular text, we find that all the families of the earth are going to mourn. Well, what did Jesus say? In Matthew chapter 24, 30 and 31, Then shall the sign of the Son of Man appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. All right, here we have the tribes of the earth mourning. It's the event. Now, up to this point, Kyle would say that, yes, that was the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Well, Zechariah 12, 13, and 14 has a context. Zechariah 13, 1 says, In the day a fountain shall be opened for sin and uncleanness. It is the very day that the unclean spirits pass out of the land. Now, the unclean spirits are operating in Acts 16 with the daughter of divination and Acts 19 with the sons of Sceva. Now, this is when the miraculous working of both the devil and the church come to an end end in this particular day the day the fountain shall be open for sin and uncleanness in churches of christ we are trained to believe this is the day of pentecost in acts 2 it certainly is not it's not the context the spiritual gifts come to an end in this day but he will say i am no farmer uh, i'm no prophet i'm a farmer for a, a man taught me to keep cattle from my youth when in the day that every prophet would be ashamed of his vision Zechariah 13, verse 4, the spiritual gifts are coming to an end. Does the New Testament affirm that the spiritual gifts would come to an end at the second coming of Christ? Yes, it does. In 1 Corinthians 1, 6 through 8, the Bible says, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall confirm you, babasso, same word in Mark 16, 20, Confirm you unto the end that you might be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And Wood said that was the destruction of Jerusalem in his debate in 1974 with Ben Franklin. Spiritual gifts, 40 years. Then the end of the old covenant world. That's the idea. Now, in Zechariah chapter 14, he says the day of the Lord is coming. This is the second coming of Christ. In his destruction of the temple and the Jewish state, and all the authorities that rejected Jesus as the authorities of the old world are now coming under his feet. And soon all things would be placed under him in order that his rule can be seen, that that temple was no longer the place of worship. That's the idea of 1 Corinthians 15. Now, the day of the Lord is coming where the city is taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. I debated a man in Amarillo, Texas a few years ago, anti-cooperation brothers, argues this is the day of Pentecost. Just the way probably Kyle would argue Zechariah chapter 13 is the day of Pentecost. No houses were rifled on the day of Pentecost. The women weren't ravished on the day of Pentecost. The brother that I debated said this was simply a picture of persecution. And persecution, he said, in the same debate could be a good thing. Oh, I see. 
So if this is a picture of persecution and women, women ravished means persecution, then women ravished could be a good thing, but women ravished means rape. Same thing happened when the Medes came into Babylon in Isaiah 13. Open up the book of the Lord and read Isaiah said, Isaiah 34, 16. No, it's national judgment language. They would flee to the mountains in this day. Zechariah 14, verse 5. You shall flee through the valley of my mountain. You shall uh, flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. They're going to flee to the mountains. That's what's going to happen. They're going to flee to the mountains. One day known to the Lord. One day known to the Lord. Now, does anybody see a train coming yet? The whistle is blowing. Kyle, the whistle is blowing. That at evening time it shall uh, happen, that it will be light. Neither day nor night, but at evening time it shall happen, it will be light. This is a picture of the changing of the covenants. The darkness is passing. The true light is already shining. 2 Peter 1, verse 19. That old world of darkness was passing. Soon they would see Jesus in his glory, in a face-to-face -face meeting. We see through the last darkly. 1 Corinthians 13 is the same picture of 1 John 2, 26, 1 John 3, 2. We do not, not know what we shall be, but when we see him, we'll be like him. We see through a glass darkly, but then face to face shall I know him, even as also I am known. Those are the same pictures from different perspectives. They had the anointing in First. Uh, John 2, 27, which is the miraculous working of the Spirit, to see Jesus in a clear way. That's what Zechariah 14, 7 is about. Now, Jesus places the kingdom at the fall of the temple, according to Luke 21, 31. When you see these things happening, know the kingdom of God is near at hand. It's the only time that Jesus spoke about the kingdom with this specific event, and he's clearly talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in Luke 21, and even Kyle would agree there. Imagine he would. Because he said in verse 32, that generation would not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now, we find in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 9, Jesus saying, the Lord shall be king over the earth in that day. What's he talking about? The destruction of Jerusalem. He's not talking about the day of Pentecost. He's talking about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. The Lord is one, his name is one. Where did Jesus place the kingdom? At the fall of the temple. The completion of the kingdom. The kingdom means one thing. God's rule in the hearts of men. That's an old covenant kingdom uh, motif in language. And a new covenant motif in language. All right? So when the old is done away, the new can be seen. But this is the coronation and the completion of the kingdom. It's just a 40-year transition of the same kingdom. The kingdom in Luke 21, 31, Kyle, is not used in a different sense. But in a different stage. They're in the kingdom, receiving the kingdom, the kingdom's coming. They're saved, they're being saved, their salvation's coming. They're redeemed, they're being redeemed, the redemption's coming. Get the idea? 40-year transition. It's a second Exodus motif throughout the New Testament. Like Micah 7, 15, according to your days coming out of Egypt, I will show unto marvelous things, 40 years, Woods argued. The last days, Micah 4, 1 and 2, the great persecution, Micah chapter 5. They would gather in troops. They would besiege us, Micah 5, 1, 2. Then the man in Bethlehem would come unto me, the Father, to deliver the kingdom back to the Father, which you misused in 1 Corinthians 15. Because Kyle, like many preachers and churches of Christ, do not know the voices of the prophets. I know how we're trained. I taught in Bible college. I've been trained. I listened to Warren and to Deaver and to Connolly. I know how we're trained. We have not been good students when it comes to the Old Testament prophecies. We have not allowed the Old Testament to be the foundation for which all of the prophecies of the New Testament are fulfilled. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. We've said that. Well, let's be consistent with it. The Old Testament predicts the second coming of Christ. Jesus proved that by Luke chapter 21, 20 through 22. So the law couldn't have ended at the cross, as we've said, because every jot and every tittle of the law and the prophets have to be fulfilled until any part of the law can pass, according to Matthew 5, 17 and 18. And so 
everything is completed when Jerusalem fell. The judgment would come. Now, in Zechariah 14.11, the Bible says, from that point there will be no more utter destruction. No more utter destruction. Kyle believes after the destruction of Jerusalem, there is great utter destruction. The prophet said no. And Amos 3 verse 7 says, God does nothing except he reveal it to the prophets. And the New Testament is simply the reiteration of the Old Testament prophecies. Now, we find that the city is taken here, and yet the remnant is left. Jesus will use this language later in Matthew 24, one taken, one left. It is not a picture of being taken up into the atmosphere. Jesus uses these figures in the opposite way. So it, during the Assyrian captivity, Judah is left alone, 2 Kings 17.18. Israel is carried away, 2 Kings 17.33. Again, you want a greater explanation, but at that day and that hour, you can get it, Kyle, on Amazon. Every time in the Old Testament, the phrases are used taken left. Elijah said, I'm left, I'm spared. They are taken, taken into judgment. The city is taken. Rebel, uh, Luke 21, 24, and the Gentiles should trodden down the city until the time the Gentiles are fulfilled, which is 80, uh, 80, 66 to 70. They're taken into captivity, taken into all nations. Kyle turns this phrase around because he thinks it's a miracle that some end of time event. There is no end of time. It's philosophically impossible, Kyle. Any being that has beginning has a reference point in time. Only God is without time. In Revelation chapter 6, 6 through 9, we find the disembodied spirits asking how long. Oh, wait a minute, they don't have a body so they don't have time. That's ridiculous. They were told it was a little while. Time will always exist for anyone who is, has, has a beginning. You will always have a reference point. Therefore, you will always continue to live, continue upon that beginning. So we say time will be no more. That's a bunch of baloney. Only God is outside of time, and he's the one that created it. He created individuals, and we live in his presence in time. So tomorrow I won't die. The next day I won't die. Because why? Death has been destroyed for me. Jesus said he who lives and believes in me will never die. And death was being overcome in the first century. All right, so taken and left. Now, Kyle misuses Matthew 24, verse 3, because he does not tell us what Mark says and what Luke says about the same event. Now remember, I used the illustration of the rich, young ruler. So we want to look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke in order to understand the full picture of the rich, young ruler. Well, Kyle only quotes from Matthew 24, verse 3. Only quotes from Matthew 24, 3. When shall these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? Then he says, now, now he's talking about the end of the physical, biological world. No. The end of the age. The temple represents the Jewish age, not the Christian age. Should the temple come to an end, their sacrifices would come to an end. Their way of life would come to an end. And the goal, the telos, would be reached. In Mark 13, 4, Peter, Andrew, James, and John are asking the questions. Because Jesus has said, has just said, Behold, your house is left to you desolate. They show him the wonderful temple. Jesus said, You see these stones? Not one stone shall be here left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Tell us when will these things be? What shall be the sign of their coming and the end of the age? The Jews had not an inkling about the end of the physical, biological world. The Bible nowhere mentions the end of a physical, biological world. 2 Peter 3 certainly doesn't. 1 Corinthians 15 doesn't. I'll prove that in just a little bit. No, no, no. On the contrary, in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, unto him be glory in the church throughout all generations forever and ever. Death, the kingdom would know no end. And the kingdom is consummated when Jesus said it was in Luke 21, 31. So why is God going to put an end to the planet? Why has he got to do that? People are being baptized, aren't they? Are we glad that Jesus didn't return when our neighbors and our friends and our loved ones are baptized? Yeah, so they can be saved. Well, if people are being baptized, 
Why would Jesus have to end the process that he began, which is an everlasting kingdom, which is an everlasting church, which is an everlasting house, which is an everlasting body, which is perfected now and glorified? That's the idea in Scripture. And so, in Mark 13, 4, where Mark says, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what will be the sign that all things will be fulfilled? All things fulfilled. All things fulfilled including the end of the age. That's the force of Mark 13, 4. Luke 21, 7, when will all these things, or tell us when all these things are about to take place, New King James Version. All these things, including the end of the age. Now, Kyle, in Matthew 24, in verse 13, the Bible says, He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. The telos, the goal, the consummation the completion, the perfection. Why does Jesus use the word telos, which is the stem of Suntelion to Ionon of Matthew 24, 3, in that part, in the first part of the Olivet Discourse? Why does he do that? Why does he say in verse 14, this gospel will be preached to all the world for a witness, and then the end will come, the telos? You're going to tell me it's not the same Suntelion to Ionon, end of the age, and they are not in the Jewish age? By the way, um, Kyle, you might want to check 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 in the pulpit commentary. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 20, where the writer there says that there are only two ages, the Jewish age, Olam Hazah, and the Messianic age, Olam Abba, of which was ending at the fall of the temple when the second coming of Christ took place. So don't blame this on King. By the way, a hundred years before King, Cyrus Jeffries, member of the church, taught that Jerusalem and its destruction was the second coming of Christ. No, it's not anything new. It's just that good Bible students have seen this all along. Just not pushed by traditions because we are simply looking at one particular passage without discovering everything. The Baptists do the same thing with faith. Well, we're justified by faith, Romans 5.1. Doesn't say anything about baptism there, right? Well, God can qualify himself and modify himself and amplify himself by himself. Scripture interprets Scripture. Not with words which man's wisdom teaches, but that which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, 1 Corinthians 2.13. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10.17. By faith Noah prepared an ark. So he had to do what God said to do. So God had to speak, man had to hear, man to obey. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. And so you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now we do that with the plan of salvation, Kyle. Come on, let's do that with the coming of the Lord. And critically analyze the text, which we have misused and misapplied and taught false doctrine over the years. In Revelation 22, 18 and 19, I testify unto every man that hears the, hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man adds unto these things, God will add unto him the plagues which are written in this book. If any man takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things written in this book. And in Revelation 22 and verse 6, these things would shortly come to pass. Revelation 22, 10, the time is at hand. The exact same phrases of Revelation 1, 1, Revelation 1, 3, which in the Hebrew reckoning is the guarantee that everything in between Revelation 1 and Revelation 22 is about the same subject. It's called an inclusio. The Hebrews call it the P and the S. There are no chapter and verse distinctions 2,000 years ago. The chapters come from Stephen Langdon in 1227, an archbishop of the Catholic Church. So don't allow a Catholic to tell you how to interpret your Bible, please. And the verses come from Robert Stevens later in 1550-something, one or we see different um, dates for that. But before that, they looked for these markers in the text to to demonstrate the uh, context. And the context of the revelation, the apocalypsis, is the same word Jesus used in Luke 17, 30, and I'll prove that's the destruction of Jerusalem in just a minute. There's only one second coming. 
It's going to appear a second time without sin and salvation. See, Kyle can't even count the destruction of Jerusalem as a coming. And yet, in Matthew 24, 27, as the lightning shines from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Greek word parousia. Singular word. Presence, it means. Well, Luke 24, 37, as the days of Noah were, so also shall be the coming of the Son of Man will be. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is the word parousia. How come he doesn't say parousias? That's the way Kyle talks. Many comings of the Lord. No. No, there's one coming. The second coming affected all of the seven churches of Asia to whom the letter is addressed, which things would shortly come to pass, which things were at hand, and he was coming quickly. They're either to be saved or judged, and that is exactly the idea when the old covenant world is judged, the gospel becomes the universal standard of judgment. That's Revelation 19.15. I'm getting ahead of myself or too fast for you. Sorry, you, learn, you need to learn to keep up. No. There is one second coming. So what is the coming in Jerusalem? 1.5 coming? 1.6 coming. 1.7 coming. 1.8 coming. 1.95 coming, but not a second coming. Not a 2.0 coming. Kyle says. No. 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 It's all wrong. It's all wrong. So Matthew 24, 13 and 14 proves that the end of the age took place in the first generation. The phrase taken left, later used by Jesus, is Hebrew hyperbole. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 20, the judgment would allow the blood to come up to the bridles of the horses. Obviously, it's hyperbole. But for a Jewish reader in the first century, when he sees 600, 1,600 furlongs, a Roman stadia, he's thinking about the land of Palestine. Now, the blood is filled up. What did Jesus say? All the righteous blood shed from the foundation of the world, from righteous Abel to Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar, will come upon this generation. Yeah. Yeah, that's the same blood. And that's the same entity, uh, entity of Revelation 18. And by the way, by uh, where Jesus said, by that day and that hour knows no one, by the time the book of Revelation is written, the day and the hour have arrived. Babylon falls. Revelation chapter 18, the hour. Revelation 18, 8, the hour, I believe it is. In verse 18, verse 10, the day. Oh, the day, I'm sorry, Revelation 14, 8, the hour, Revelation 18, 10. 18, 8, 18, 10. And then he says, I saw the smoke of her burning, what is like the great city. Rome didn't burn, well, by Nero, but it fell in 40, 476 A.D. It's not a picture of Rome. He says, and in her was found the blood of prophets and saints of all who were slain on the earth. What did Jesus say in Matthew 23? All who were slain on the earth of the land. From righteous Abel to Zechariah, son of Barachias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Revelation chapter 11, the great city is called spiritually Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Could it be any clearer? Matthew has the Olivet Discourse. Mark has the Olivet Discourse. Luke has the Olivet Discourse. The Gospel of John does not have the Olivet Discourse because the book of Revelation is his Olivet Discourse in which Jerusalem is destroyed. And at the judgment of the city, the two witnesses are told to come up here. Why? The temple of God was open in heaven. What did Jesus say in Matthew 24, 30 and 31? Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. There is the last trumpet. Gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That's the resurrection. That's resurrection language. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1, we find... The Apostle Paul, addressing the Thessalonians who are undergoing a Jewish persecution, proven from Acts chapter 17, by the way, and he speaks about our coming and our gathering together. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. Where? In the clouds. Matthew 24, 30, 31. The gathering together of the clouds, the trumpet is blowing, the Son of Man is coming 
in the clouds with power and great glory. But that's not the second coming of Christ. How many comings in the clouds with power and great glory are there? No, there's only one second coming. And who's the man sitting in the temple of God? He's the high priest. He's going to be destroyed at the time of the second coming of Christ. And 2 Thessalonians is written in 52 AD. They're undergoing a Jewish persecution. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, since it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Who were troubling them, Kyle? They were being troubled by the unbelieving Jews. Now, that's the context. 1 Thessalonians is written one year earlier, 51 AD. The reason he Right, so early is because Satan hindered them from coming back. There's some kind of security that Jason made in Acts 7. He couldn't return, so he has to write these letters. Well, in 1 Thessalonians, we find the same persecutors are being spoken about. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14, to which he called you by our gospel, the obtaining of our glory, Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm sorry. You, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you will also suffer the same thing from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans. Who's persecuting them in Acts 17, 5 through 8? The Jews, the unbelieving Jews, stirred up the men in the marketplace, suborned men, and created a disturbance, who killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and persecuted us. That's the unbelieving Jews. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles. That's the unbelieving Jews that they may be saved, so as also to fill up the measure of their sins. What did Jesus say? Matthew 23, 2, fill up the measure of your sins. How many measures are there to fill up? There was great one measure, and now the wrath of God is unleashed in Revelation chapter 14 upon the old coveted people. That's the idea. But wrath has come, has come, present tense verb, upon them to the uttermost. Judgment has begun. You ought to read Tacitus sometime in the 60s. What happened in the 60s? In 66 AD, Tacitus says that there were hurricanes everywhere, earthquakes everywhere. Men died indiscriminately on the funeral piles which they had gone to mourn the ones that they loved. Indiscriminate death, a time of trouble like no other trouble. 68 through 70, there are four seizures that ruined the world. The whole world knew something was about to take place and the church was about to be crowned in its glory, in its kingdom. That's the idea. And it's an everlasting kingdom, which means it's an everlasting church. Kyle wants to destroy it. What a bunch of baloney. It's a bunch of rot is what it is. Sorry if I'm too vituperative, but the Lord has taught me to hate every false way. Psalm 119, 128, and it is a false way. Now, in Matthew 24, verse 8, these birth pangs are used in the context of the coming of the Lord. A woman's birth pangs are closer together, stronger right before the child is born. You don't know the day and the hour. All right, That's what he's saying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 and 2. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. That's the thief coming of Matthew 24, which Kyle posits at the end of time somewhere. It's just ridiculous. But when they say peace and safety, who are they? Who are persecuting the Thessalonians? In 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 17, Kyle, the unbelieving Jews. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Where did the Jewish leadership go for that last Passover feast, Kyle? Where they would, Titus let them in, wouldn't let them out anymore. In the three and a half years of that times, times and a half a time, the Jewish war would begin when resurrection would take place, according to Daniel 12, 2 and Daniel 12, 11 through 13. No, they're all in Jerusalem. Persecution was over. The last stone was dismantled. The end comes. The judgment comes. The resurrection takes place. The gathering together of the elect. You see, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is the same thing as Matthew 24, 30, and 31 in Matthew 8, 11, and 12. Same thing. 
Paul writes to the Thessalonians who are suffering. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, It's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Who are troubling them? 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 17, the unbelieving Jews are. So he says, we were alive and remained till the coming of the Lord. Some of the Thessalonians would remain. Not, he's not talking about thousands of years later where somebody remains. They are in a persecution. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23, your whole spirit, body, and soul be preserved to the coming of the Lord. He doesn't want any of the Thessalonians to die before the coming of the Lord. Some of you will not taste death till you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Most of you will die. Some of you will not. We misapply Mark 9.1 because we separate it from Mark 8.38. In Matthew 16.27 and 28, it's the same matter. It's the same matter. Most of them would die. Some of them would not. That's how Jesus consistently uses the phrase. And we say, well, Judas died and the kingdom came in, in Acts chapter 2. That's not the idea at all. It's the completion of the kingdom they're looking forward to. And so they want to be preserved. Now, we'll by no means precede those who are asleep because he's going to gather them together first. As they're coming, the gathering together takes place. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 24, 30, and 31? Then will the sign of the Son of Man appear in heaven. Then will all the tribes of the earth mourn. Same motif and theme of Revelation 1-7. The tribes of the earth would mourn. We're not in tribes today. They were Jewish tribes. They're going to mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. He will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. There's the last trump. And gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And the gathering and the coming of the Lord are the same thing in 2 Thessalonians 2 1. You need two witnesses for your doctrine. You need two witnesses. They're the same thing. And so now they're gathered together. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. That's the last trump of 1 Corinthians 15. Kyle's got more trumpets in his theology than a ragtag band. The seventh trump of the book of Revelation is the last trump of 1 Corinthians 15. And by the way, don't want to get ahead of myself, but in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, then it shall come to pass the saying that death is swallowed up in victory is a direct quotation from Isaiah 25 and verse 8, Kyle. Does Paul know what he's talking about? Is he quoting in context or out of context? He's quoting in context. That's the time also that tears are wiped away from their eyes. What's the context of Isaiah 25? A fortified city? Well, made a ruin. It would never be rebuilt. Isaiah 25, 2. Isaiah 25, 12. The high fortress of your walls will be brought down, lay low to the dust. The destruction of the city of Jerusalem. What did Jesus say? When you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know its desolation is near. Then let those in Judea flee to the mountains. Let not those in her midst, uh, let the, those in her midst depart. Let not those in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. That's including Isaiah 25, 1 and 2, Isaiah 25, 8, Isaiah 25, 10 through 12, which is a part of the great judgment of the old covenant people, Isaiah 22 through 29, sometimes called the little apocalypse. No, it's the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Paul is quoting in context. The death was being overcome was old covenant death. I will annul your covenant with death and shield, Isaiah 28, 18 which meant separation from God. My son was dead. He's alive again. He who lives and believes in me will never die. Paul said I was alive once. The commandment came, sin revived. I died. That's death. Separation from God. One day old covenant death would be overcome in Christ through the new covenant and upon its completion, which marks the completion of the church, completion of the kingdom, completion of the body, the glorified body, the resurrection took place, and now we're in the presence of God in an everlasting kingdom. If I'm going too fast for you, sorry, you should keep up. After all, you're an apologetics press. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, a voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. There are seven trumpets in the book of Revelation, aren't there, Kyle? How are the six, first six heard? By the angels. They are the apostles of the seven churches, still announcing through this great period Judgments coming upon the ancient world. The first angel, the first apostle, uh, sets forward. The second angel of the churches sets forward. Judgment is coming. And so they see the seven trumps, or simply the picture of the 
seven seals and the seven bowls of judgment, which are retelling of the same event of the great judgment upon Jerusalem, and the time was at hand. And Kyle, no, at hand cannot mean afar off. Those two terms are contradictory, every bit as much as 2 Peter 2, 7, where Lot, a righteous man, is vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Righteousness cannot be wickedness, because contradictory ideas cannot ever mean the same thing. And at hand means near, afar off, like Hebrews eleven seventeen means afar off, because Abraham saw the, the uh, salvation of God afar off. And don't use Isaiah 56, 1 either. You don't understand how it's used. It's used at the same time. Salvation is near when? The eunuch would no longer be a dry tree. So when the eunuch in Acts 8 obeys the gospel, he's no longer a dry tree because he has a family. He is now baptized into Christ like Paul, who is a eunuch for the kingdom's sake, has a son in the faith. He's got a family. He's got a family. Their salvation is near. What does Romans 13, 10 through 12 say? Our salvation is nearer than when we believed. The night is passing. The day is at hand. You get the picture now? The old covenant world was going away. The law ended by means of the cross, not end of the cross, proven by animal sacrifices in Acts chapter 21. That's the day of Pentecost in Acts 21. Kyle, do some study. You can't participate with animal sacrifices for influence sake. Can you use instrumental music for, for influence sake? I don't think so. Isaiah 66, 3, one day, if they offered up a lamb, it would be like breaking a dog's neck. If they offered up a bull, it's like murder. Offer up incense like blessing an idol. No, no, they can't do that if the law is ended in Acts 21. No way. No way. By means of the cross, but not at the cross. All right, and one more thing here. Um, well, I've been going a while. All right, one, one more point. I think I'll, I'll finish the lesson next time. I don't want to go too long. Um, so, Kyle says there's no signs, like the days of Noah. No signs like the days of Noah. Okay, all right. Did Noah build something in his life? Let's see. Let, let's, let, let, let's make sure that we get our deep theological glasses looking at the text and really get this powerful, powerful truth. Did Noah build an ark? Yeah, pretty sure he did. <laughs> Forgive me for being facetious. Of course, Noah built an ark. You can't even think about Noah without the ark. It's like the times of Noah. This ark is 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high, right? Anybody out there been to the replica in Kentucky? You can see that ark for quite a while, can't you? It's pretty impressive. You don't think that ark was a sign? I was talking to a preacher in the Church of Christ. He said, no, there was no signs. The ark was not a sign. <laughs> what? And Lot, he didn't have signs to leave the city like the days of Lot. Remember Lot's wife? By the way, in Luke 17, 30 and 31, he was on the house top and his stuff in the house, let him not to come down to take it away. One taken, one left. It's the same exact phrase of Matthew 24, 16, and 17, and Kyle will say Luke 17 is the second and final coming of Christ, but not the first part of Matthew chapter 24. What? No, 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 yes. Did Noah know when to get into the ark? Yeah, seven days ahead of time. He knew when to get out of, the, uh, to get into the ark. But it's like the days of Noah. To whom was the flood a surprise? To the disobedient. On a day when they did not expect because they were disobeying. That's the context of Matthew 24, 44, which Kyle misused and took it out of its original context. Kyle, the out of it discourse is not divided. Get my book of that day and that hour. I refute this concept completely through Scripture, Old and New Testament alike, demonstrating that there is one great narrative, relationship lost in Adam, relationship restored in Christ, so that death is overcome for us. For Jesus said, if you live and believe in me, you will never die. That's pretty good news, I think. Your doctrine is fanciful. 
He believes in the greatest miracle could take place at any time, and yet the age of miracles have passed, he said. What about the principle of parsimony? All right. Well, let me end here. I'm going to do another video on 2 Peter chapter 3, which he misused. The context begins, Kyle, in 2 Peter 2, 1. 2 Peter 2, 3. And he uses the word swiftly in the way he does shortly. Same Greek word in 2 Peter 1, 14. So the false teachers would experience their judgment in the same way that Peter was about to die. 2 Peter 1, 14. So seven verses later, he said they would receive swift Toxane destruction. So 2 Peter 3 has that context. I'll deal with that next time. But Kyle, you misused these scriptures. You missed it by a country mile. If you want to debate me, I'm open. Two-night oral debate, four-night oral debate. You're choosing. Write up your proposition. Get the venue. If not, I'll invite you to the Lakeshore Church of Christ. You can debate here and convert a bunch of preterists, as we are called. I don't like that term, by the way. I prefer fulfillment. That's what Jesus says. I believe in fulfillment. Preterist is a Latin term. means past. There are many things that are past in Scripture. I just believe that all things are fulfilled in Christ now. So you can get back with me. I challenge him to a four-night, two-night public debate. Let's iron out these matters. Let's see who has the truth, please. Let him prove his Pentecostal doctrine of a miracle sometime in his future. Explain all these things. He can't do it. All right, so I'm going to leave you with that. Remember Proverbs 4, verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. With all your, uh, and with all your getting, get. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. With all your getting, get understanding. All right. You guys have a great day.